she makes Room Monday's uh, event. Uh, it is the second event of uh, our project that is around wool. First, uh, we had the first Wool Mondays that was about mapping local ecosystems. So we have created a map where you can find uh, farmers, uh, spinning manufacturers, uh, sellers, designers. And the second part is about how do we design with wool? And we have many labs that they are uh, in parallel researching about the natural dyes. So I will give the uh, word to my colleague Cecilia Raspanti from uh, Amsterdam Textile Lab that she is leading this part. Hello, Cecilia. Uh, we cannot hear you. No. Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Anastasia, for the introduction. So we will have a fun afternoon. We will first explore a few things together. We will see some of the research that we've done collectively. We will see what is happening locally in all different places. And we will have a short, uh, couple of short demos on different dyes and dyes processes. So today it's all about wool and color. And this is a very quick and short introduction of the She Makes project. Or... She Makes is an international community of partners and labs engaged in empowering women to innovate and contribute to a more sustainable textile and clothing industry. She Makes offers a series of opportunities for inspiration, skills exchange, and networking. Our community combines two powerful networks, Fab Academy and TCBL, which is short for Textile and Clothing Business Labs. Fab Academy is a group of fab labs that provides higher education at the intersection of digital fabrication, textiles, and biology. For SheMakes, these labs are developing a free series of modules to learn skills that combine tech and textiles, such as wearables and smart devices. These activities are models that can be brought into any space, from libraries to museums, incubators to businesses. Labs are also thinking about how to overhaul existing production processes, like, is there a better way to make wool? Through workshops and working together, we'll find out. The other half of she makes, TCBL, focuses on the business side of things, ensuring that the business and social innovations that come out of she makes labs are tested in real world situations. TCBL associates from companies to citizens meet in real life or online to discuss the latest trends in sustainable fashion and imagine how we can work together to transform the industry. Together, she makes partners, labs, and companies are focusing on female innovators in textile and clothing. Why? Because women in this industry tend to be in the lowest paying jobs and their natural and acquired skills just aren't valued. But women managers statistically generate more success than men and tend to be more focused on social and environmental issues. So that's why we need more female fashion innovators at the helm, building a sustainable future for all of us. If you believe in the values of innovation, sustainability, and equality, take a look at the SheMakes.eu website and social media. Sign up for our newsletter or reach out to one of the participating labs to take an active part in the future of fashion. She makes us receive funding through the Horizon 2020 program. For more information, see www.shemakes.eu. So this was a small peek into the world of She Makes. And we're in the second year of this project. She makes is an international community. I'm going to go next slide. 
And as Anastasia was saying, we've been researching in three separate groups, but also combining a lot of knowledge together about woo. And today we're all about coloring woo. This is very shortly our agenda. We will spend the first hour together exploring a little bit what is the research done, what are the uh, problems that we tackled, what were we looking at. And then we will start um, a demo of natural dyeing. We will look first at mother and wealth, so at more than dyes. Then at board, and then we will see uh, what's happening at the other workshops, for example, with Birch Park, with the Farm Lab, or we will be tapping into uh, Yak and Park Textiles, where we will see how to dye with natural waste, sorry, food waste, with Redo, and please tell me I'm saying it right, Portamacuflori. We will be seeing also how to eco print, and the green fabric will give us also an update. So we're many labs, and we know that there are many more people online. I uh, hope you enjoy, and you can always go back to these slides later on. We will be sharing them with you. So if you see anything you can catch now, there is always a moment later. So natural dyeing. Well, what we hope to do today looks a little bit like this. It's sort of exploring everything that's possible with natural colors and with our local wools. Here in Amsterdam, we will be looking at Dutch wool. At the farm lab, they will be looking at Austrian wool. So each locality is looking at their own colors, whatever are their own local materials for coloring that are growing there, that are being wasted there, trying to utilize them and combining them with different local rules. Because natural dyeing, oh, the slide starts a bit in a funky spot, looks a little bit like this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Um, it's quite a simple process, it looks like but it has a lot of complications when you start exploring all the different variations you can create with one color. Just to give you an example, these are all dyed with matter and you see many oranges and yellows and reds, but I can say the same of these, which are much more tending to purples and pinks. So different colorants are able to produce many different shades. Usually the process is done by preparing the wool, scouring it, cleaning it, especially from the lanoline. And often you, what you buy in the shop is already been scoured, is already been cleaned. Um, especially also when you buy fleece, for example, here in Amsterdam, we will mainly we uh, dye in uh, plain fibers. And then there's a second step that is usually necessary, which is more than thing. And we do this with alum. We will be looking also a little bit of mix and challenges and about alu, about the natural dyes and about all of its modifiers. The last step is the dyeing process, which means we will try to work on extracting color from the plant by mixing it with water. We will work with mainly soluble dyes, only one dye that is insoluble in water, which is indigo, where we will look at the reduction process. Then we will be adding our wool to the dye pots and then we're able to either work with it in shades, so going from very soft pastel to intense tones, or we will be mixing and over dyeing different colors, depending on where you are and what the local labs had to explore uh, with their waste. So, challenges, myths, and opportunities. Um, very often when we speak about natural dyes, we see that a lot of people think like, oh yeah, that thing of the past, the thing that only a few craftsmen do. I'm like, why? This is, this is an important point because if we look at our past, if we look at our history all over Europe, there is so much knowledge and some of it is getting lost. But natural dyes was a way for economy to try to sell. For example, here in the Netherlands, especially in Salem, we were growing a lot of mekra, which is a red root, it's madder. Uh, in the south of France, they were growing a lot of wood, a type of indigo-producing plants. In Germany, you will find many places where they were growing well. So in all of Europe, you will see that these three dyes were very popular because they very well were growing locally. Some of them, we say they're native because they're native from, we know for sure, 1300. So it's been a long time that they're here, but they're not actually fully native. But the natural dyes world sort of started to collapse with the advent of synthetic dyes in the second half of 1800. They were cheaper, they were faster, 
but they're not exactly the same. And they, in my opinion, also do not produce exactly the same beauty and shades. That part was necessary back then to advance technologically and understand how else we could dye, how we could produce larger quantities, how we could deal with different problems. And as a result, today, we're looking at this image of natural dyes where it's for the crafter or it's something of the past. When she makes, we believe that actually there is a lot of space for natural colors in the future as well. Because the entire world is looking at circular economy, we're looking at ways to, to work with what is local, what we can grow locally, what can empower people locally, to create smaller loops, decentralized loops that actually enable people in small groups rather than very large scale industry maybe. So we wondered if we could create a setting and explore what is possible at the lab scale with the tech and the technology of today and the knowledge of yesterday. So we always say when we look at color, we like to take a step back into our past and then a step forward into the future, also looking at other possibilities. So what we hope for the future is that we see a lot of naturally dyed wool and colorful rainbows showing up everywhere. In all of this, one of the main um, question was also how can we work creating a chromatic scale, but how can we also work zero waste? And many different questions started to pop up, especially regarding more than thing, regarding alu. And the more we were researching, the more you find funny facts about alu. Often it's thought to be, oh, it's aluminium, it's not good, but it's not per se aluminium, it's an aluminium compound. So it's aluminium potash, so it's a potassium aluminium sulfate. And we actually discovered that it's been used in many environmentally friendly practices differently than what many people were thinking. So we found out that it's used in closed water to diminish algae bloom because it rebalances the pH and it helps the water come back to it. It's uh, used for skin and little cuts. I don't know if you know from the past, these little sticks for shaving uh, the man use, you can wet them and then it will help prepare your skin. It can be disposed in water, uh, but it can also be disposed in soil because the soil will uh, absorb it and actually you will have a slightly uh, acidic soil, which is very good for growing, for example, wisterias or hydrangeas, which actually need uh, acidic soil. And it, of course, can be uh, diluted in water. It's always good to also add a little bit of chalk. So here we started to tackle the first material that we needed and try to understand how we can uh, deal with it. And what we do locally is actually also reusing it. So all of the wool that we, will, that we have been using and we will be using today has been already more than that. And the water has been used many different times and then we simmer down so that we have just a little bit and it's concentrated. The growing matter, the growing matter, well, we really decided to look at what's local what we could grow, back from bacterial to fungal to botanical, to understand also what is the local biodiversity, what are waste products that we can use that are actually around us. Because trust me, if you really start looking at wherever you live, at your environment, you will see that color is everywhere. It's just about understanding which plants bear it, how to extract it, and how you can then further utilize it. Okay, so what we did in She Makes was also really working on a value-based research. So we said it had to be local, we looked at waste streams, we looked at the large scale opportunities, we looked at what grows locally, what could be locally empowering, what is heritage knowledge, and what is the local biodiversity, what are those endangered species that actually belong here and are diminishing, and can we boost these again? We looked at what is bio-based, so can we grow it? Is it organic or inorganic? And most of all, nothing harmful. And we looked at zero waste. It means that we looked at how we could recycle dyes into pigments. And for the ones of you that are here, there are some of them there on the table. And later on, I will show them also in the slides. How we could recycle our mordants and how actually leftovers from one dyeing process can feed a second dye process. For example, 
Mother, mother roots are a great reducing agent, a great source of sugar for producing an indigo vat, a fermentation vat. Instead of adding new sugar, we can use the waste of another dye. This is also a practice that was used very much uh, around 1500, uh, especially here. And in France, there is a lot of knowledge and information on how the dyers were actually just choosing to deal with two colors only, a variety of types of wool, and create a full color palette. And most of all, of course, we wanted it to be sustainable. It had to com combine well with wool, with the wool ecosystem, with the sheep's ecosystem, and had to have a holistic approach. This is the wool value chain as we started to research it last year here in Chimates. And what you see in red are the steps of the dyeing processes, and what you see in blue are the tools processes, which is the next workshop of next Monday. So you will see that these two processes intersect very much. We also very much enjoyed working with wool and color because it offers great versatility. You can dye fibers and then you can work on monocolors such as these ones, one by one creating different shades. But you can also work on blending fibers and playing with color in that way. So from your two starting shades, you can blend very well wool in good fine fibers and create beautiful combinations, as you see also in the slides. But also yarn and how we could mix different colors while spinning or creating gradients and patterns on the yarn itself. Think, for example, the cat weaving, where you already dyed the yarn beforehand, as well as felt and knit fabrics, which we will see for the echo printing especially, and of course, piece dyeing or printing on entire garments. So we see we have a lot of opportunities to intervene with color on the wool value chain. The three main research lines um, for this project were the botanical dyes here in Amsterdam, the wood and bark dyes at the farm lab, and eco printing in Romania with Redu. And here again on the right side, you see how the different processes will interlace with the steps also of next Monday. So you see that the bat and the modern dye can be done with the cut fibers before they're carded or when they're uh, just after being spun or on the woven cloth or knitted cloth where you can also then either dye or print. So these are the three sections. Here in Amsterdam we work with botanical dyes, so plants. We work with two processes, mordant and bat, and we dye fibers. For the farm labs, we will see the bark dyes. These are direct dyes without a mordant, and they will be executed on yarns. And at Redo, with Porta Macuflori, they will be exploring flower prints, leaf prints with echo printing on cloth. We will have a small peek into the different labs that are joining us today. So here at Textile Lab Amsterdam, we have been researching color well, myself for a bit more than 10 years. Um, and it's an adventure that never stops. And once you get addicted, you have a problem because it really never stops. You start exploring the plants, the bacteria, the fungi, minerals, everything around you truly has color and produces color. The whole city, if you take a walk in autumn, it's full of gold nuts. You can collect them and you can create beautiful grays. Uh, sometimes you have blue grays or green grays out of specific types of walnuts. Sometimes you have more purplish grays and you can reach, of course, beautiful blacks. And these are just some simple ones. It's full of flowers at the moment. If you go and collect most of them bare color, some of them will fade away, but many of them will actually, if you more than your textile correctly, they will stick. So what you see in the image here on the left side is some of our uh, local samples and here you see some of the inks that we've been researching in the last years so these are also many of them you see for example the elderberries are from Amsterdam North and also from Amsterdam Subo. so it's really looking around you what is there and try to collect a little bit and not too much so that you can balance out and you don't disturb the environment. In the center, you see a series of pigments that have been uh, recycled from different natural dye sessions. And our exploration in Chimex on different dye matters 
which are the color combinations that we could create with only three dye matters, and which are the yarns that we could produce. All of this research, you can also find back bits and pieces uh, and some background information in the Biochroms Lecture and Recipes of Public Academy, uh, which you can find also on the handbook uh, online and on the slides. For us, this journey also started really in 2018, where we actually, well, maybe some of you were here today, I'm not sure. Um, in 2018, we had the Worldwide Distributed Workshop, exactly like the one of today, but there we were tackling um, the research on bacterial dyes that we had been executing between 2015 and 2018. And also here you can have a peek at bioshades.org if you want to look at recipes or background knowledge. There is a lot of information there. And today, today we will be mainly exploring Dutch rainbows, as we call them, because yes, we weren't sure at some point that Dutch rainbows would really exist or would, but they exist and not only in the sky. So our research produced this beautiful chromatic scale you see behind it. It is three botanical dyes only, madder, indigo, and weld, combined and over -dyed. Two processes, the bad dyes on the left side for the indigo and a little bit of the purple, and the more than dyes for everything else. And one waste management plan, because as we were saying, we were really trying to make sure we will have a session that is zero waste and everything at the end is either reusable or turned into something else. And here as well, for example, the madder root was a great reducing agent for the indigo vat. The alum we recycled for the next sessions has a 50% of strength. And the dye waste water was recycled into lakes, lake pigments to dye wool again. And wool is a wonderful material in that sense because you can keep reusing the color and take it a step further. For us, dyeing is a journey. So these are some of uh, the examples on the top right, pigments from recycled uh, lakes. In the center, you see some of the seeds that we collected here in Amsterdam. Uh, these are some of the plants. Some of them grow on, well, on my balcony, <laughs> which is now a huge forest of plants from indigo, about 150 plants of indigo to weld, to wood. Um, many of the different types of flowers such as cosmos and coreopsis that are really great also for echo printing and you see some of the seeds there and at the bottom right you see all of the different um, dye matters that we tried out and this to say that at the end it's a journey because what you want to do is document 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 and i don't say it because <laughs> this is what we do all the time also as textile lab but i say it because the moment we start to capture things in time, we start to understand how plants grow, what are the steps they go through, and actually how we can contribute to the environment in a different way. You start looking at your environment with different <coughs> eyes because you keep taking the same walk every day and you see plants changing or harvesting throughout the seasons and you start to understand when they're ready to give you something. And next we will hear from the bark dyes at the farm lab. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Hello. So I'm Sylvia from explain a bit our research, our starting point, and uh, to also explain a bit what to expect in our wash, workshop about dying with the barks. So first of all, we are a farm lab, which means we are a farm. Actually, we have sheep, we have... Um, uh, we have sheep, uh, we have a field, uh, we have everything you would have in a farm, but we are also a fully equipped and functioning fab lab. So we have all the uh, machine and uh, um, logistics you would have in a, in a fab lab. Uh, and our starting point uh, is not so much as uh, Cecilia explained in, the, uh, in Amsterdam, um, our research about um, uh, colors but is rather a research about how to implement logics 
uh, in the countryside that are totally uh, sustainable, zero kilometer and, and circular. And we do this by combining the, um, the knowledge of the countryside as well as the material with the knowledge of the um, digital technology. So we try to combine and cross over these two worlds of the, um, of the countryside and the tradition and the world of innovation international network. We try to cross over uh, these worlds uh, to uh, develop projects that make sense for um, the countryside or environment in the countryside. So keeping this uh, idea in mind, uh, for us, all the material are, of course, uh, local. Uh, and so we, we have been developing a series of projects, but in particular about dyeing. We have been developing uh, dyeing with um, indigo. Of course, indigo that we planted from the seeds uh, in February, and then we start harvesting in June, and then we, uh, till September, and then we planted again. So in, uh, uh, we've been dyeing with plants that we actually um, grow ourselves at the farm. Uh, we've been dying with uh, food waste, uh, which is something that is kind of also uh, zero kilometer because you have it uh, at home. And as we will see, we've been dying also with uh, bark. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so why, why did we buy with darks? Well, it has been a bit of a, a circumstance because we, we've been, we started to collaborate with the She Makes projects uh, that was winter. And um, we, we decided to focus on dyeing uh, natural dyes. And so there are not um, so many dyes uh, that, you can, that actually are available in winter, especially if your starting point is go, go out and harvest them. And so we, uh, we discovered that our options were limited, but uh, well, thanks to this book, which is a very nice uh, handbook for uh, natural dyes, the Wild Colors by Jenny Dean, uh, we discovered that we, we had an opportunity um, uh, of dyeing with barks uh, because there are various uh, trees uh, whose bark is um, suitable for a permanent uh, color um, uh, in wool and other fabrics. So this was uh, especially interesting for us because <laughs> of course in the countryside it's, it's full of, of uh, uh, trees so we could uh, easily harvest the specific bark for making for carrying out this uh, experiment. So a very interesting so the first interesting aspect of the dying with bark is that you can uh, die with bark at any time. So obviously you should harvest bark that is and without arming the, the tree, uh, which means either on a, a fallen tree or on a side uh, dead branch. Now, not damage the tree because if you get the, the bark out of a, a live tree, you, you would kill it. Uh, and so we, we carried out a series of experiments, especially um, we have this, this is dyed with birch. This is dyed with uh, apple trees and this other is dyed with cherry, uh, cherry bark. So we carried out a series of experiments um, and, uh, and that's why we would like to uh, explain to you today how to dye with bark. It has also another interesting feature which uh, keeps it very uh, low budget that uh, you don't need mordant for, for, you don't need to mordant the fiber because the, the bark is already very rich in tannin that already has makes this function of more dant in the fiber. So it's just, you would just need bark. If we go to the next slide, please, we would go quickly through the process. So the only thing you need so is a cheap process available uh, because uh, you will need to soak the harvest, uh, the different barks. For example, you can um, apply this process, we said with apple, uh, cherry and birch, but you can also apply it with uh, peach bark or with um, or with pear that we're gonna try today. Also, the pear uh, bark with plum, apricot, uh, elm. Uh, so there are all a, all a series of bark that uh, uh, are suitable and give this interesting pinkish yellowish um, uh, result. 
so we said it's, it's not just a, a cheap process and available all over the year and uh, without uh, more venting, but you need time because you need to harvest the bark, soak them in water for at least one week in order for the dye to start uh, um, kind of uh, for, for the, the, the bark to, to get soaked and release the dye. Um, and then you need to, um, the process is very slow as well because you at, any, at every point you need to avoid the, the bark to boil because when the bark boil, it releases too much tannin and, don't, and then all the, all the dye will, will turn towards brown without losing a bit this um, brightness of the different shades. So this, uh, this means that you will need to also to <laughs> reach the, the, the simmering point very slowly and also working with wool, you know, to avoid the wool to felting also is a very slow process, um, both in uh, reaching the simmering point and to variating the, the temperature. So you have to keep in mind that it's a very simple process, very cheap, available all over the year, but you'll need time. So uh, today we have already the harvested the, the, the bark. So we have bark of um, pear tree and bark of birch. I have it here some sample for you to show that we already pre we previously already soaked in water for uh, one week. Um, so after the, the soaking procedure, we would uh, filter it. And uh, one, one more minute, we would filter the fire, filter uh, to separate the dye from the, the, bir from the, um, the, the birch. Uh, we would have the fiber already prepared, so already uh, cleaned and scored. Uh, we will dye with uh, yarns. Uh, and then we will again reach the simmering point with the, um, with the dye and, uh, uh, and the yarns. So it's as simple as that, just requires time. And then if we have time, we will also modify uh, some sample with um, iron liqueur to see how to modify the color. So we will apply one modifier. So that's what we aim to do today. And uh, I really hope you get interested in the dyeing with bark, which is an amazing natural material. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. I am uh, Andrea from Redu. Uh, mm -hmm. Redu is, uh, is a social enterprise uh, from Yash, Romania. Our uh, main concern is, concern is uh, giving new life to the textile waste uh, that we collect from uh, factories. Uh, we also have an interest in, uh, in wool. Uh, of, course, through, of course, we rediscovered it through the She Makes project because it's a um, it's a fabric that is uh, mostly uh, discarded to the landfill and it's not used uh, well until this year because now the laws have changed and uh, everyone is going to have to uh, take care of the wall. So uh, this event, it's uh, uh, one of the best ways to learn how to do it uh, close to your home with natural, with natural dyes and without any impact because we work with other kinds of waste, uh, textiles and natural fibers. We were also interested in uh, uh, eco printing, which we knew from uh, Elena from Puerto Mocuflori. Uh, she, uh, we met about a year ago and we were amazed of, uh, of her work. Um, I'm gonna let her uh, introduce herself because she's the one that's going to held our hands-on workshop today in Yash but you're going to see that in our general camera. For now, uh, Elena. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Elena. Uh, I represent the uh, Quarta um, uh, The concept uh, I created uh, in Borlesht, uh, in the uh, county name Nantes, is a slow fashion uh, initiative that aims to bring back uh, to our attention clothes dyed with plants uh, that represents an awakening to the importance of uh, protecting the environment. Um, Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, about eco-printing. Um, 
is a creative way of uh, transforming the textiles by giving gratitude to nature and keeping a, a piece of all its beautiful uh, patterns on our clothes. We'll experiment uh, with pieces of woolen cloth and print them using traditional plant-based methods. Recommended plates. Plants, uh, cherries, uh, oak leaves, saffron, uh, fern, roses, or chrysanthemums. Uh, don't forget to mordan the wool cloth beforehand. More about this uh, we will see uh, in our workshop. So can we have the next slide on which we prepare the show, a very short uh, teaser of what is going to happen today in our uh, in uh, in the eco printing workshop. În Yes, hello everyone uh, from here, from uh, Barcelona. I hope that uh, you can hear me. Uh, we have been researching uh, in the natural dyes uh, within the co uh, context of the Fabricademy postgraduate program, Textile and Technology Academy. And the image that you can see in here, and also you can see the real piece on the wall here at uh, Barcelona, is a collaborative artwork that we do while we do the uh, workshop of learning a natural diet. So all of the students, they learn how to extract colors. Mainly here uh, we see a lot of food waste and organic waste. Um, and then you learn how to also do the modifications. Uh, this uh, piece has been exhibited in various exhibitions. Uh, it is uh, two meter by one and a half. And it was also accompanied by uh, the color bar, which is, was the bar restaurant uh, concept where you have the different colors that are extracted from the natural dyes and you can supposedly drink them. Not, it's uh, more conceptual, but it is like these shots of color that they can waken you up. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, we also researched um, by foraging uh, in the forest. And randomly we bumped on this uh, puff ball mushroom that is called dye ball or the dye maker's mushroom. And there is a, a, a big research around mycopigments. So, so uh, this one, we were very lucky uh, to suddenly use an application on the phone that can recognize which mushroom you, you found. And we, it was the, the one that is used especially for giving the brown colors and you can see the process in the wool. And then if you can go to the next slide, uh, we also, within the bacterial dyes, again, within the Fabricademy program, we also, Petra, uh, which is the, also co-hosting the workshop today with me, um, she did the research on dyeing uh, wool with the bacterial uh, dyes, with microorganisms, with living organisms, a different, uh, completely different, as Cecilia was mentioning, you can see more about it in the BioShades documentation. 
And today, uh, if you can go to the next slide, what we will be using mainly, we have uh, different stations. Uh, so we will be using a lot of uh, organic food waste, so, such as pomegranate peels, avocado peels, onion peels, and carrot tops. But also we have some um, logwood and cochineal uh, so that we can uh, obtain other types of colors. Thank you. Thank you. And next, last but not least, you will see the green fabric. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, at the green fabric, we host uh, two weeks ago and two days event that uh, wool in Belgium. Uh, we had um, workshops around um, natural dye with uh, local uh, plants. You, know, you can you can see in the video that it's just a small uh, view of what we've done uh, with the local uh, plants in Belgium. Uh, we have uh, workshops and we it was like uh, yeah. You can see the, the results. And then uh, we also visited a um, uh, uh, garden with a um, um, tinctorial uh, ah, plants. Yes. plants. Thank you. Uh, it's called the Calido Garden, and it's just like five minutes uh, walk uh, from uh, the green fabric. And so you can see uh, there is a lot of plants uh, that you can dye with, and it's all about the history uh, of natural dye in Brussels. So it's, it's super interesting. And today we are gonna work in, uh, with the ecoprint in, but in uh, wool fibers. So we can have like nice shiny results. And we also, with the results, uh, with the yarn that we dyed in uh, workshops um, from uh, two weeks ago, we, we will mix it uh, as we saw uh, previously, and see what colors we can get um, with all the the colors that we we got. Yeah, and we also have Maria Boto here. She's working uh, on uh, bacterial dyes, and she uh, is gonna talk to us about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 